Lately in the headlines, there have been reports of barracks boxes being taken over by hackers. Uh, you know, I've seen the, the headlines from Radio World, hackers taking over radio stations. Well, kind of. What they're doing is they're accessing the station through their STL. So how do you, as a broadcast engineer, protect your station? This is where the IT world and the broadcast engineering world are going to collide. So let's make ourselves a little diagram here. We've got our studio over here, and then we've got our transmitter site over here. The way that you know we've traditionally been doing this is you've got your studio side STL transmitter, and then that would be sent over 950 megahertz microwave link to the receiver at the transmitter site, and that'll spit out the audio to the transmitter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Cool, that was the old school way of doing it. Now, if somebody, if this were an analog STL path, if somebody were to set up a little antenna here in the path and transmit into their STL receiving antenna, well, that would be one way of taking it over. And there really isn't too much you can do to prevent that. But we're talking, that's old school. Let's move on, then you have Let's change out this, um, let's change out this analog audio, uh, path for digital. Okay, that's now a digital path. Well, it's harder for them to take it over. So you, if they were to, if this hacker here were to transmit into your, your receive antenna, what would happen is you would just have nothing for the most part. So that's our little history lesson. But most stations today have moved on from this type of path and this type of STL. Yeah, they're still available, they're still around, and but mostly people are using them as backups. Where are we today? Today, the internet and IT world and IP has become the, the chosen method for moving your audio from your studio to your transmitter site. So let's look at our paths as they stand today using networking. So again, we still have our studio. Whoop. And we still have our transmitter site. Whoop. But in the middle, let's just say we're doing it through the internet. In the middle, we have the internet. Pay no attention to my handwriting. I know it's terrible. I know, I know. So in the studio side, we're now using things called codecs and barracks, Comrex, Gates Air, APT. Um, I'm sure there's other ones out there that I can't think of. Zephyr IP, Zephyr iPort. There's a bunch of options that you have out there. But for this discussion, we're just gonna call them Codec. Codec. And on this side, we've got another codec. Okay. And what the early days of these links were is that people would be connecting their codecs directly to the internet and directly from the internet to the receiving codec. And that worked fine for a very short time until people started realizing, oh, look, we can hack into these things. And we can take over a radio station and play the whatever we wanna play. So we can't do that anymore. If you're still running your codecs naked on the internet, with one exception, two exceptions, one exception really, don't do it, stop. And the only exception is Gates Air, and I'll talk about why for that one here in a moment. But let's talk about three different ways that we can protect our new IT, IP, internet-based STL codex. And we'll do that right after our wonderful sponsor, Angry Audio. Angry Audio offers all sorts of gadgets and gizmos from headphone disconnectors to prevent you from ripping the headphone jack right out of the console 
two mic processors and software to make your streams sound amazing. I wanna focus on something specific, the Angry Audio Rave. It's their powerful yet affordable audio console built for radio stations just like yours. The Rave has eight stereo line inputs, up to four microphone inputs, two output mix buses, two mix minus outputs, a monitor feed for your control room, and so much more. The Rave is made of anodized aluminum, silky smooth faders, and tally outputs for your on-air light. Get major market quality at small market prices. Learn more at angryaudio.com. Thank you, Angry Audio, for sponsoring this video. So I was talking about our IP codecs, our IP STLs that we're using through the internet these days. So this is the old school way of doing it. We still have those internet connections, but what we're going to do is, where's my, where's my erase tool here? Let's, let's get rid of some of this stuff here. Okay, and so now let's come back over here. So now in between our codec and the internet is going to be a firewall, firewall. And a lot of these firewalls will have a, a VPN ability on them. Um, I've used Peplink, I've used Fortigate, uh, the Cisco's can do it. So there really isn't an excuse these days to not have at least this basic level of security. So you have a firewall on that side. You'll wanna have a firewall on this side too to protect your internet, uh, your transmitter site. So now these have become little self-contained secure areas from whatever the wild internet it's got coming at you. So you still have your codec connection to the firewall, which then the firewall will send it out to the internet, back out of the internet, into the firewall, into the codec. Now you can do what's called NAT, uh, network address translation. You have an internal ad address inside, and then you have a public address on the outside. Great, that is a good way of doing it. That's one way of doing it. So a hacker cannot necessarily access your device directly. What has happened is a lot of people are putting barracks boxes, I'm gonna pick on them because that's what's been in the news lately. People have been putting public IP addresses into a barracks box in a mission critical spot and expecting it to stay secure. Don't do that. If you were to have a firewall with the firewall rules that are doing some network address translation, then what you can do is you can kind of lock it down. In your firewall rules, you can say, whatever the um, address is on this public internet, that one is okay. And that's gonna get forwarded on and translated to your internal address for your codec. Does that kind of make sense? I'm asking you like you can respond. <laughs> so basically that's one way of doing it. You're locking down what you're looking at. It's, if you're an RF guy, it's very similar to using a directional antenna to be able to listen from only one direction. That's great. That's fine, but there are other ways of, of being able to attack. So let's uh, let's back out some of these uh, things here. Oops, I went too far. The other thing that we can do is create a point-to-point -point VPN. So most firewalls can do VPNs. So let's uh, let's bring up this this VPN. What happens is the firewall. I'm just gonna use firewall as the generic term right now. The firewall will create a connection all the way through to the other firewall. You tell it, you know, what is the IP address on the far end, and then the other firewall will 
be able to do a reverse tunnel as well. Now you, for all intents and purposes, have a private connection between your two sites. It's not perfect, nothing is perfect. There is no, well, I take that back. The only perfect network security is to completely unplug it, turn it off, power it off, period. So I'm not talking about that, but okay, now this VPN tunnel has an advantage, generally has an advantage. Again, there are so many uh, variables and options that you can do with, with network security, but generally the advantage to this is now you're only talking from your internal address to an internal address. And so let's say, you know, this is 192.1.10, and this is gonna be 192.168.2.10. So it's still an internal IP address that you are connecting to. And a lot of these codecs will have ways of dealing with uh, packet loss and things like that. And that's outside of the scope of this discussion. So, okay. <laughs> I, I'm just kind of all over the place with this, aren't I? So your VPN will provide that next layer of security. That's great. But now you have this issue where you have somebody who has infiltrated your network. That's not good, that's bad. Which means they can now go across this VPN and attack your codec on the far side. How do we prevent that? Well, your firewall should be preventing it, but let's just say something happens. Somebody on the inside of your network found a USB stick in the parking lot, plugged it in, oops. Okay, so the other thing that we can do, back out those changes, is on your codex. This codec right here comes equipped with a password. Use it, please. And don't use the default password. You get the new box, it comes with a default password. You log in with that default password. Item number one, change it. Change that password, please, I'm begging you. Make it something somewhat secure that you're gonna remember. Use a password manager, put it in your password manager, write it down in your notebook, something. But don't use the default password. So changing the default password on these codecs will provide another layer of security. And that will go for this configuration with the VPN tunnel. This will go in the configuration of network address translation. And this will go for running it straight naked on the internet, which please don't do. But if you do, if you have to, for whatever reason, at least change the password. There are other codecs that will have stream passwords. Um, Comrex does it, Gatesair does it. Um, I'm not sure about the others, but there's a place where you can put a password in the stream that will allow it to make a connection on the receive side. If it doesn't have that password coming in, then it's not gonna listen to whatever that stream is doing. So that's another layer of safety that you've got on there. Okay, that's kind of of what we're talking about. So let's go, let's go over it one more time. Item number one, change your default passwords. Item number two, don't run your codex naked on the internet. Have at least a firewall and use network address translation. Item number three, which we're getting better in, in security, is using a VPN tunnel to go from your studio to your transmitter site. That, and that is regardless of 
what you're using, if you're using Starlink, point-to-point uh, -point microwave link, internet, whatever, fiber, having a VPN tunnel. And lastly is using the security built in on the streams. So the password on that receive side, if it doesn't see that password, it rejects the stream. That is the rapid fire protecting your STL because if you don't protect your STL, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when your STL will be hacked or will be compromised. And you don't wanna be the one that has to explain that to station management. I don't wanna to have to explain that to station management. So there we go. That's protecting your STL in a nutshell. There are tons of internet uh, videos on the internet that will talk about VPN, that will talk about network address translation. Uh, that is outside of the scope of what I'm doing here. While you're here, please watch some of the other videos. I have transmitter site tours, I have studio site tours, I have talks about technology, I have tools, that uh, tools of the trade. So um, yeah, and until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep learning.